Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. So, there was only one thing that made you a wizard. That wasn't surprising when you thought about it. Complex machinery was always universal within a sexually reproducing species. If gene B relied on gene A, then A had to be useful on its own, and rise to near universality in the gene pool on its own, before B would be useful often enough to confer a fitness advantage. Evolution never looked ahead. Evolution would never start promoting B in preparation for A becoming universal later. If magic had been like that, a big, complex adaptation with lots of necessary genes, then a wizard mating with a muggle would have resulted in a child with only half those parts and half the machine wouldn't do much. And so, there would have been no muggle-borns, ever. Even if all the pieces had individually gotten into the muggle gene pool, they'd never reassemble all in one place to form a wizard. If magical genes weren't complicated, why would there be more than one? And yet, magic itself seemed pretty complicated. A door locking spell would prevent the door from opening, and prevent you from transfiguring the hinges, and resist finite incantatum and alohamora. Many elements all pointing in the same direction. You could call that goal orientation, or in simpler language, purposefulness. There were only two known causes of purposeful complexity. Natural selection, which produced things like butterflies, and intelligent engineering, which produced things like cars. Magic didn't seem like something that had self-replicated into existence. Spells were purposefully complicated, but not, like a butterfly, complicated for the purpose of making copies of themselves. Spells were complicated for the purpose of serving their user, like a car. Some intelligent engineer, then, had created the source of magic and told it to pay attention to a particular DNA marker. The obvious next thought was that this had something to do with Atlantis. Harry had asked Hermione about that earlier, on the train to Hogwarts after hearing Draco say it, and so far as she knew, nothing more was known than the word itself. It might have been pure legend, but it was also plausible enough that a civilization of magic users, especially one from before the interdict of Merlin, would have managed to blow itself up. The line of reasoning continued. Atlantis had been an isolated civilization that had somehow brought into being the source of magic, and told it to serve only people with the Atlantean genetic marker, the blood of Atlantis. And by similar logic, the words a wizard spoke, the wand movements, those weren't complicated enough of themselves to build up the spell effects from scratch. Not the way that three billion base pairs of human DNA actually were complicated enough to build a human body from scratch. Not the way that computer programs took up thousands of bytes of data. So the words and wand movements were just triggers, levers pulled on some hidden and more complex machine. Buttons, not blueprints. And just like a computer program wouldn't compile if you made a single spelling error, the source of magic wouldn't respond to you unless you cast your spells in exactly the right way. The chain of logic was inexorable. And it led inevitably toward a single final conclusion. The ancient forebearers of the wizards, thousands of years earlier, had told the source of magic to only levitate things when you said, Wingardium Leviosa. 
There was a story from the dawn days of artificial intelligence, back when they were just starting out and no one had yet realized the problem would be difficult, about a professor who had delegated one of his grad students to solve the problem of computer vision. Harry was beginning to understand how that grad student must have felt. This could take a while. A reason? There is nothing that can excuse! What I did to him was worse. Harry, what have you done? I tricked Draco into believing that I tricked him into participating in a ritual that sacrificed his belief in blood purism. And that meant he couldn't be a Death Eater when he grew up. He'd lost everything, Headmaster. There was a long quiet in the office, broken only by the tiny puffs and whistles of the fiddly things, which after enough time had come to seem like silence. Dear me, I do feel silly. And here I was expecting you might try to redeem the heir of Malfoy by, say... Showing him true friendship and kindness. Ha! <laughs> yeah, like that would have worked. Tell me, Harry, did it even occur to you that there was something incongruous about setting out to redeem someone through lies and trickery? I did it without telling any direct lies, and since we're talking about Draco Malfoy here, I think the word you're looking for is congruous. And this is the hero. We are all doomed. The long, narrow tunnel of rough stone seemed to stretch on for miles. The reason for this was simple. It did stretch on for miles. The time was three in the morning, and Fred and George were starting the long way down the secret passage that led from a statue of a one-eyed witch in Hogwarts to the cellar of the Honeyduke's candy shop in Hogsmeade. How's it going? Still on the fritz. Both, or? Intermittent one fixed itself again. Other one same as ever. The map was an extraordinarily powerful artifact, capable of tracking every sentient being on the school grounds, in real time, by name. Almost certainly, it had been created during the original raising of Hogwarts. It was not good that errors were starting to pop up. Chances were that no one except Dumbledore could fix it if it were broken. And the Weasley twins weren't about to turn the map over to Dumbledore. It would have been an unforgivable insult to the Marauders, the four unknowns who'd managed to steal part of the Hogwarts security system, something probably forged by Salazar Slytherin himself, and twist it into a tool for student pranking. Some might have considered it disrespectful. The Weasley twins firmly believed that if Godric Gryffindor had been around to see it, he would have approved. In time, Fred and George clambered out of the dusty cellar, strewn with barrels and racks of strange ingredients. Fred and George waited. It wouldn't have been polite to do anything else. Before too long, a thin old man in black pajamas clambered down the steps that led into the cellar. Hello, boys. I wasn't expecting you tonight. Out of stock already? Not exactly, Mr. Flume. We were hoping you could help us with something considerably more... interesting. Now, boys, I hope you didn't wake me up just so I could tell you again that I'm not selling you any merchandise that could get you into real trouble. Not until you're 16, anyways. George drew forth an item from his robes and wordlessly passed it to Flume. Flume looked at yesterday's edition of the Daily Prophet and nodded, scowling. The headline on the paper read, The Next Dark Lord? And showed a young boy which some student's camera had managed to catch in an uncharacteristically cold and grim expression. I can't believe that Malfoy. Going after the boy when he's only 11. The man ought to be ground up and used to make chocolates. Fred and George blinked in unison. Malfoy was behind Rita Skeeter? Harry hadn't warned them about that. Which surely meant that Harry didn't know. Well, Harry didn't need to know until after the job was done. Mr. Flume, the boy who lived needs your help. All right, what do you want? When Rita Skeeter was intent on a tasty prey, she didn't tend to notice the scurrying ants who constituted the rest of the universe, which was how she almost bumped into the balding young man who'd stepped into her pathway. Miss Skeeter, fancy running into you here. Who do you think you are? How very foolish. It would have been wise to memorize the face of the disguised Death Eater training Harry Potter to be the next Dark Lord. After all, that certainly sounds like someone you wouldn't want to run into on the street especially after doing a hatchet job on him in the newspaper. Rita took a moment to place the reference. This was Quirinus Quirrell? He looked too young and too old at the same time. No, that wasn't important. She had a time and a place and a beetle to be. she just received an anonymous tip about Madame Bones making time with one of her younger assistants. 
The tipster had said that Bones and her young assistant were due to eat lunch in a special room at Mary's place. A very popular room for certain purposes. A room which, she found, was secure against all listening devices, but not proof against a beautiful blue beetle nestled up against one wall. Quirrell pulled up the sleeve of his left robe, showing his left arm. Observe, no dark mark. I would like your paper to publish a retraction. Forget it, Buster. Now take a hike. Miss Skeeter, I had hope to find some lever that would prove persuasive. Yet I find that I cannot deny myself the pleasure of simply crushing you. It's been tried. Now get out of my way, Buster, or I'll find some horrors and have you arrested for obstruction of journalism. Goodbye, Rita Skeeter, said his voice from behind her. As Rita bowled on ahead, she noted in the back of her mind that the man was whistling a tune as he walked away. Like that would scare her. Sorry, count me out. I'm more the giant spider type. The boy who lived had said that he had important work for the Order of Chaos. Something serious and secret. More significant and difficult than their usual run of pranks. And then Harry Potter had launched into a speech that was inspiring yet vague. A speech to the effect that Fred and George and Lee had tremendous potential if they could just learn to be weirder. To make people's lives surreal instead of just surprising them with the equivalents of buckets of water propped over doors. Fred and George had exchanged interested looks. They'd never thought of that one. Harry Potter had invoked a picture of the prank they'd pulled on Neville, which, Harry Potter had mentioned with some remorse, the sorting hat had chewed him out on, but which must have made Neville doubt his own sanity. For Neville, it would have felt like being suddenly transported into an alternate universe, the same way everyone else had felt when they'd seen Snape apologize. That was the true power of pranking. Are you with me? Harry Potter had cried, and Lee Jordan had answered no. Count us in! Lee Jordan gave a regretful grin and left the deserted and quieted corridor where the four members of the Order of Chaos had met. The three members of the Order of Chaos got down to business. It wasn't that sad. Fred and George would still work with Lee on giant spider pranks, same as ever. They'd only started calling it the Order of Chaos in order to recruit Harry Potter after Ron had told them about Harry being weird and evil and Fred and George had decided to save Harry by showing him true friendship and kindness. Thankfully, this no longer seemed necessary, although they weren't quite sure about that. So, what's this about? Rita Skeeter. She's been asking questions about me. Can you guess what I want you to do? You want us to slip her some of our more interesting candies? No! No, no, no! That's giant spider thinking! Come on, what would you do if you heard that Rita Skeeter was looking for rumors about you? That made it obvious. Start rumors about ourselves! Exactly! But these can't just be any rumors. I want to teach people never to believe what the newspaper says about Harry Potter, any more than muggles believe what the newspaper says about Elvis. At first, I just thought about flooding Rita Skeeter with so many rumors that she wouldn't know what to believe. But then she'll just cherry pick the ones that sound plausible and bad. So what I want you to do is create a fake story about me and get Rita Skeeter to believe it somehow. But it has to be something that, afterward, everyone will know was fake. We want to fool Rita Skeeter and her editors and afterward have the proof come out that it was all false. And of course, given that those are the requirements, the story has to be as ridiculous as it can possibly be and still get printed. Do you understand what I want you to do? Not exactly. You want us to invent the story? I want you to do all of it. I'm sort of busy right now, plus I want to be able to say truthfully that I had no idea what was coming. Surprise me. For a moment, there was a very evil grin on the faces of Fred and George. Then they turned serious. But Harry, we don't really know how to do anything like that. So figure it out. I have confidence in you. Not total confidence, but if you can't do it, tell me that, and I'll try someone else, or do it myself. If you have a really good idea for both the ridiculous story and how to convince Rita Skeeter and her editors to print it, then you can go ahead and do it. But don't go with something mediocre. If you can't come up with something awesome, just say so. Fred and George exchanged worried glances. I can't think of anything. Neither can I. Sorry. And then Harry began to explain how you went about thinking of things. It had been known to take longer than two seconds, said Harry. You never called any question impossible, said Harry, until you had taken an actual clock and thought about it for five minutes by the motion of the minute hand. Not five minutes metaphorically, 
Five minutes by a physical clock. And furthermore, Harry had said, you did not start out immediately looking for solutions. Starting out by looking for solutions was taking things entirely out of order, like starting a meal with dessert, only bad. Harry then launched into an explanation of a test done by someone named Norman Mayer, who was something called an organizational psychologist. One set of problem-solving groups had been given the instruction, do not propose solutions until the problem has been discussed as thoroughly as possible without suggesting any. The other set of problem-solving groups had been given no instructions, and those people had done the natural thing and reacted to the presence of a problem by proposing solutions. And people had gotten attached to those solutions and started fighting about them. The first set of problem-solving groups, the ones given instructions to discuss the problem first and then solve it, had been far more likely to hit upon the solution, so Harry was going to leave this problem to Fred and George and they would discuss all the aspects of it and brainstorm anything they thought might be remotely relevant and they shouldn't try to come up with an actual solution until they'd finished doing that. Unless, of course, they did happen to randomly think of something awesome, in which case they could write it down for afterward and then go back to thinking. And he didn't want to hear back from them about any so-called failures to think of anything for at least a week. Some people spent decades trying to think of things. You didn't ask about your budget. I could just tell you the amount, but I think this... will be more inspiring. Don't spend it for the sake of spending it. Only spend it if awesomeness requires. And what awesomeness does require, don't hesitate to spend. If there's anything left over, just return it afterward. I trust you. Oh, and you get 10% of what's there, regardless of how much you end up spending. We can't! We don't accept money for that sort of thing! But I'm asking you to put in some real work here. A grown-up would get paid for doing something like this, and it would still count as a favor for a friend. You can't just hire people for this sort of thing. Fred and George shook their heads. Fine. I'll just get you expensive Christmas presents, and if you try returning them to me, I'll burn them. Now you don't even know how much I'm going to spend on you, except, obviously, that it's going to be more than if you had just taken the money. And I'm going to buy you those presents anyway. So think about that before you tell me you can't think of anything awesome. He strode a few steps away and then turned back. Oh, one last thing. Leave Professor Quirrell out of whatever you do. He doesn't like publicity. I know it'd be easier to get people to believe weird things about the defense professor than anyone else, and I'm sorry to have to get in your way like that, but please, leave Professor Quirrell out of it. And Harry turned again and took a few more steps, looked back one last time, and said, softly, Thank you. And left. There was a long pause after he'd departed. So... The defense professor doesn't like publicity, does he? Harry doesn't know us very well, does he? No, he doesn't. But we won't use his money for that, of course. Of course not, that wouldn't be right. We'll do the defense professor separately. But are we really going to be able to do Harry's job? Harry said to discuss the problem before trying to solve it, so let's do that. The Weasley twins decided that George would be the enthusiastic one, while Fred doubted. It all seems sort of contradictory. He wants it to be ridiculous enough that everyone laughs at Skeeter and knows it's wrong. And he wants Skeeter to believe it. We can't do both things at the same time. We'll have to fake up some evidence to convince Skeeter. Was that a solution? They considered this. Maybe, but I don't think we should be all that strict about it, do you? So, then the fake evidence has to be good enough to convince Skeeter. Can we really do that on our own? We don't have to do it on our own. We can hire other people to help us. That could use up Harry's budget pretty fast. This is a lot of money for us, but it's not a lot of money for someone like Flume. Maybe people will give us discounts if they know it's for Harry. But most importantly of all, whatever we do, it has to be impossible. So impossible that we don't get in trouble because no one believes we could have done it. So impossible that even Harry starts wondering. It has to be surreal. It has to make people doubt their own sanity. It has to be better than Harry. Fred's eyes were wide in astonishment. This happened sometimes between them, but not often. But why? They were pranks. They were all pranks. The pie was a prank. The remember all was a prank. Kevin Entwistle's cat was a prank. Snape was a prank. We're the best pranksters in Hogwarts. Are we going to roll over and give up without a fight? He's the boy who lived. 
And we're the Weasley Twins! He's challenging us! He said we could do what he does! But, I bet he doesn't think we'll ever be as good as him! And we have to be more impossible than him! It's what Godric Gryffindor would do! That settled it, and the twins snapped back into... whatever it was that was normal for them. All right then! Let's think about it!